Hello again, everyone. I'm Dr. George Simon, and welcome to another edition of the New Character Matters. This is the program where we talk about what I consider to be the defining issue of our time, the character crisis that we face and that has been in place for some time now and affects every aspect of our lives, from our politics to our world affairs to our individual affairs, our business affairs, our relationships, our marriages. Every aspect of our lives is affected by this issue. And this is where we have a discussion about what we can do to turn things around. And today we're going to be wrapping up a discussion about what I consider to be one of the more fundamental values espoused in uh, my book, Character Disturbance, in a section called the Ten Commandments of Character that is being transformed into a brand new book, uh, an announcement coming about the release date pretty soon. Um, and uh, one of those commandments has to do with reverence for the truth. And so today we're going to be wrapping up a discussion about that. Um, you know, to revere anything is to hold it in such esteem that it's akin to some kind of awe, something so valuable, something so precious that you can hardly comprehend its value. And that's the way it is with the truth. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we've lost our reverence for it. Uh, and it isn't that it's lost its value. Perhaps there's nothing of any greater value in so many ways. And we'll get into a discussion about that in just a bit. But we've lost our reverence for it and its power. Its power not only to liberate us, but to empower us. There are so many ways, there are so many ways to either disregard or distort the truth or to live in a fantasy world, to make things the way we want them to be. Our capacity for deception is virtually unlimited. Our capacity not only to deceive each other, but to deceive ourselves. It's a basic human capacity, and it's at the root of many of our ills. So uh, in wrapping up this discussion about not just the importance of truth, but the importance of ho holding it in reverence, to do our best to humbly discern it, which is tough enough. It's tough enough to humbly go about the business of trying to know the real truth. It's another thing entirely to reckon with it, to want to reckon with it. So before we move on with our discussion about this and wrap things up, I want to uh, reemphasize uh, some of the major points made in the last podcast uh, about relationship deception. Just to summarize, these days, a lot of deception goes on in relationships. Sometimes it's deliberate. Sometimes certain personalities, certain characters, certain more malignant narcissists uh, deceive deliberately. They deceive in a predatory way. They're calculating, conning individuals who have an agenda that they don't want you to appreciate. Folks like Bernie Madoff, for example, have an agenda in mind. They want to steal your wealth, for example, but they don't want you to know that that's what they're up to. As a matter of fact, they may want you to think they're about anything else. And so they craftily weave a web of deception designed to ensnare you into their schemes. Uh, these heartless predators have been called by many names, uh, and I describe them in my books, 
in sheep's clothing and in character disturbance, the Judas syndrome, and how did we end up here as the predatory aggressors among us? But there's another way relationship uh, deception happens, and it happens more often uh, than the predatory type of deliberate conning and deceiving. And that's when uh, you get deceived simply because someone's capacity for charm, their capacity for likability, uh, having certain personality characteristics uh, that can sway you, uh, their capacity for positive impression management, making a good impression on others, knowing just what to say, what to do, their capacity for these things uh, in a way blinds you. It's not a deliberate attempt to deceive you, but because we've lost the art of appropriately vetting character, discerning character, we allow ourselves to be charmed. We allow ourselves to be taken. And the veil doesn't come down until much later. And we see things more clearly. We see a person for who they really are. And that perhaps would have been an easier task if we had taken the time and made the effort to really discern things on the front end. Getting past the charm, getting past the person's capacity to make a positive impression, getting past the person's natural amiability and really vetting their character, understanding their values, looking at their modus operandi, their MO, how, how they tend to relate, how they tend to get the things they want in this world, how their behavior reflects their adherence to some kind of, of well-developed internal moral compass. Those are the things that will bode well for an intimate relationship. But we don't pay attention to those things. And because we don't pay attention to those things, we get blindsided. So sometimes relationship deception is deliberate, part of an elaborate conscious scheme or con game to take advantage of you. But most of the time, relationship deception happens because we're not doing our character homework. And we get just exactly what we deserve for not doing our character homework. I know that sounds rough, but it's the truth. And if there's anything I'm permitted to in my work and on this program, it's telling the truth about why we are experiencing so many of the problems that we are experiencing. I titled this program, Character Matters, for a reason. Because whether we like to admit it or not, whether we consider it or not, whether we care about it or not, it matters. Character matters. And times were when a lot of time and energy was placed on developing it because it held such an important place in our society, in our families, among all of our friends and relatives. Nothing was regarded with more reverence at what time. So, we made it our business to hold ourselves and each other and others to account. Character mattered. And it will matter again when we paid enough price and are sick and tired of being sick and tired of all the problems that have resulted from our uh, tacit permission to let character take a backseat to a whole host of other desires, 
things will turn around when we decide that character matters again and we start doing our homework on ourselves and on the individuals with whom we consider relationships. Now, on today's program, in wrapping up uh, our discussion on the great importance of truth and the need for much more reverence for it, uh, I want to first say that the truth has practical value. And, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln is credited with saying, honesty is the best policy because of its practical value. The truth always outs in the end, after all. But that saying actually comes from uh, an Aesop fable, Mercury and the Woodsman. But the statement, honesty is the best policy, really has to do with a very practical value that in the end, the truth will out always. And the folly of the lie will always be exposed in the end. And in the meantime, there's always a price to be paid for not telling the truth. Always a price. And that applies not only to the lies we tell each other or to other people. It applies most especially to the lies we tell ourselves. And that's what I want to focus on in today's program. Because when I say, as I'm not the first to say it, I'm repeating a very powerful uh, admonition given to us by some other great sages. When I say that the truth has the power to set you free, that it's empowering and liberating at the same time. I'm talking about its potential to grow you in ways you can barely imagine. There are so many dimensions to character, the predominant ones being emotional health, psychological health, personality and character health, spiritual health. These are all contributors overall. These are all contributors to what I consider to be overall character health. And honest self-reckoning lies at the core of that kind of personal growth and development. We have it within us to be much more than we can imagine. But... That must start with a commitment to honest self-reckoning. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today, the importance of that. It's like a priceless pearl. There's nothing like it. And we need to have reverence. We need to hold it in awe. We need to esteem the value of honest self-reckoning if we're ever to truly grow into the kind of persons that we have it within us to be, and if we're ever to have the kind of world that we have it within us to make. Now, as I mentioned before, we are great self-deceivers. Some of us uh, deliberately try to manipulate others through deception, misrepresentation, distortion. But most of us deceive ourselves more insidiously and deceive others more insidiously. And I want to contrast some of the old thinking about why we do such things. The old notion was that we present an image to others and to ourselves because the truth is hard to bear. The truth about our baser selves and our basic instincts is just too unpalatable, it causes us too much distress. We hate to admit who we really are and what we're really up to. So we fashion 
internal rationalizations. And we, we do that unconsciously. That's the old thinking. And the old thinking was that we primarily do this uh, to avoid the pain that comes along, the anxiety that comes along with qualms of conscience. So, you know, the old thinking is basically that we know we're flawed, but it's too painful to admit it. And without even thinking about it, unconsciously, we construct an opinion of ourselves that makes us feel better. And we present an image to others that makes us feel good about ourselves, even though deep down, somehow we know the truth. This old thinking has outlived its usefulness, I think. And I want to focus today uh, on the real reason that I think that we as human beings have this penchant for not being entirely square. Yes, yes, it is a bit painful to think about all the less than noble things that motivate us, concern us, drive us. Yes, it is a bit disconcerting uh, to own honestly all that is within us. But that's not the bigger reason that we sometimes engage in self-deception. The bigger reason is that we are creatures of economy. In fact, we have this attitude toward work, labor, that is kind of interesting. We want to get the most reward for the least amount of effort, which is why we've spent eons throughout history developing technologies from the wheel a long time ago <laughs> to all of the uh, technologies that we enjoy today. It's why we spent so much time and energy de developing technologies that would allow us, at least we thought, to work less and to profit more, to enjoy more without having to put much into it. What a self-deception that's turned out to be. The quality of life actually perhaps is less now is weaker now, is more impoverished now than it ever has been, even though we've deluded ourselves into thinking that we enjoy all the comforts that we do for a very little price. But we are inherently creatures of economy. So what we strive to do is do the least amount of work for the most amount of reward. That's our angle. And there's a particular kind of work. I talk about this in my books, all four of them. And I have talked about it in uh, many articles on my blog at drgeorgesimon.com. That's D-R-G-E-O-R-G-E-S-I-M-O-N.com. There's a particular kind of work that to some is truly a four-letter word, but to others defines the most important value of their life. It's a certain kind of labor that truly defines love. It's working on behalf of someone else, or more particularly, it's working on behalf of something bigger. It's voluntarily laboring in an enterprise that serves something bigger than just ourself and our self-interest. That's truly the definition of love. So to love ourselves, just as to love our others, is to be willing to work. And as many great sage has said, we can't know how to love others until we first know how to love ourselves. And this is where the power of honest self-reckoning comes in. And it's also why we hesitate to do it. You see, it's much easier. It's much easier to just twist the truth about things 
it's much easier basically to lie about ourselves, our intentions, the condition of our souls, than it is to do the work necessary to make of ourselves a better person. If character and its formation were an easy prospect, everyone would do it and we would live in a utopian world. But the fact is, developing character is hard. It's extremely hard. But like anything that costs a lot, it is of supreme value. And the willingness, the willingness to do the work and the actual laboring that it takes to do the work is the very definition of love. And it has to start with us. There's no way that we can truly love another person or this world well until we know how to love ourselves well. And love demands sacrifice. It, dem it demands that we put our selfish desires aside and undertake a certain kind of labor in love. It means that we take ourselves to task when we need to, that we admit our mistakes and our shortcomings when we need to. It's much easier, it's much easier to just twist the truth about things when we know we've made a misstep. Yes, it does cause some anxiety. And yes, there is some truth to the fact that uh, it helps assuage some of that anxiety to twist the truth of what we've done, what it's cost us. But that, that's not the biggest reason why we do it. The biggest reason why we do it is because we know at some level that to be better and to do better, we have to work harder on ourselves. We get to a point in life where we, we get relatively comfortable. We get into a comfort zone. We stop stretching ourselves. We find um, a modus operandi, a way of relating, a way of thinking about things and doing things. We find a way of getting along in this world that seems to work for us. It's compatible with our innate predispositions, and it's, um, it seems to fit with the environment we have to face. So we get into a comfort zone, and we tend to want to stay there because moving out of it is uncomfortable. It's work. It's effort. And unless there's some overriding higher principle driving us, we have no motivation whatsoever to change, to grow. That's why all these commandments that I've been talking about work together. And just to rehash a bit, the very first thing we have to do is overcome our inherent egocentricity and recognize that there is something bigger, something more vast, something more infinitely awe-inspiring and incomprehensible, that we can barely imagine it. But there is something bigger, and it's responsible for our very existence. So it behooves us to recognize it and to take it into consideration and let it guide us. It's also in our best interest to overcome any sense of entitlement because this fantastic gift that we enjoy is a totally unearned gift. And there are no entitlements in life, even though we tend to want to think so. And then it behooves us to develop a positive sense of who we are and what we're worth. To get the balance right, to not be either so full of ourselves 
that we think that we're all that or to be so uh, self-esteem lacking and so down on ourselves and have such a poor self-image that we don't think very much of ourselves, that we doubt our worth and therefore we're vulnerable to uh, gravitating toward those who know how to make us feel good, but also have the potential to use and abuse us and exploit us. Folks who don't have a good opinion of themselves will naturally gravitate toward those they see as more powerful and capable. That's the heart of what we call emotional dependency and what all of the uh, misusers of the codependency term uh, all over the internet and in multiple books all over the place call codependency. Codependency is a real thing, by the way. But what we commonly call codependency, clinicians are the worst abusers of this term, is usually, what we usually mean is emotional dependency, predicating our worth on the opinion of another. That's dangerous too. So all these values that the commandments that I've been talking about represent, they all work together and they all lead us to the importance of reckoning honestly and humbly with the truth. It has power. It has power to transform us and one heart at a time. It has the power to change the world. It's tremendous power. But the root of all evil is in the lie. And it's because it's so much easier to lie. You know, there are some folks who just can't stand to admit defeat. It's too much of an assault on their already inflated ego. So whenever they experience defeat, they have to find a scapegoat. They have to blame everyone else and everything else. It couldn't be them. And the old thinking, of course, as I mentioned, is that they do that because it causes them too much inner pain and distress to admit that they fell short. That's not why they do it. They don't have the capacity to love and they don't wanna do the work. And it's because they don't serve anything higher than their dear, sweet old selves. If they did, if something else bigger than them were at the center of their soul, they would say, okay, you know what? I failed here. And it's going to take me a lot because I know how I'm made. I know how I'm kind of hard hardwired. And I know how my habits have been reinforced. And changing my ways, boy, that's not going to be easy. But if... I put something else before me. If I see the bigger picture, if I don't have any sense of entitlement, but rather a deep sense of obligation, and if I'm going to get the balance right about my worth, then I'm going to reckon with the truth. And I'm going to resolve to do better next time, and I'm going to do the work that it takes to get there. The power of honest self-reckoning is immense. I'm not the first to say it. It has the power to set you free. It is liberating and empowering at the same time. It is the way we heal ourselves and in so doing, one heart at a time, heal the world. I'm Dr. George Simon. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the new Character Matters. The time uh, for the live broadcast coming up next month in the first week of October uh, will be posted on the YouTube channel here uh, in the next two days or so uh, and will be available on the website.
at drgeorgesimon.com. Till next time, take care.